Welcome back. You're gonna love this final session of Identity Plus with Kimberly Bryant. Kimberly is the founder and CEO of Black Girls Code, a nonprofit organization dedicated to changing the face of technology by introducing girls of color to the field of technology and computer science. Today, she'll be sharing how minorities have shaped our technological culture and why it's so important to amplify their innovations for the future. Welcome, Kimberly. Thanks so much for joining us. Good afternoon, everyone. I'd like to first start by thanking the team at Okta for inviting me to deliver the keynote address for the Identity Plus conference. While this has certainly been a transformative and at times a stressful year for many of us, I'm sure, it feels great to be able to take a step back and reflect on my work and some of the things that inspire me to keep going even in the most trying of times. I'm looking forward to sharing some of the stories of my heroes and sheroes from the past and to shine a light on some of the future leaders who are helping to both envision and build a better future for us all. I also want to reflect on the power of identity to shape how we as technologists frame our collective futures. Now, before this year and in those days prior to 2020 and this new normal that we find ourselves in, I would generally spend a great deal of my time as CEO of BGC on the road speaking to audiences all over the world. But I have to tell you, it always fills me with such excitement to connect with fellow technologists and change agents like yourselves. Traveling the world is great, I must admit, but I get the most joy and fulfillment on the rare occasions that I'm able to sit in a classroom full of future technologists from Black Girls Code. These rooms that are filled with bright, brilliant, techie girls, it has a certain magnetic and powerful energy. And in those rooms, I, I feel like some type of magic happens. Now, I can't really name what that magic or that secret sauce is. Um, sometimes we like to call it black girl magic, but I, I think it's more than that. These rooms are filled with promise of hope and possibility. It's the opportunity to create more rooms like those at BGC that fuels my daily mission and drives me forward with a hunger to increase the diversity and inclusion in the tech industry. I'm absolutely convinced that the future success of the industry relies on our ability to ensure that we can bring everyone into rooms like those at BGC and even in this virtual room that we're sharing today. We need every hand, all hands on deck to create a better future for us all in this next, what I like to call industrial revolution that's fueled by technology. However, this notion of identity and how we frame who gets to play a role in this technical revolution is important. Your identity is how you define who you are, but it's also very dependent on how others define you. And quite often, these definitions are not the same. In the 21st century, we're witnessing a challenge to these traditional notions of identity and what it means for each of us. And I think it's incredibly important to look back at some of those paths we've already traveled achievements we've already accomplished in order to build a pathway for a better and more inclusive future. And so I'll jump right in. Now, the longer I spend my time as the CEO of BGC building this, what I like to call a bridge to the future, the more I find myself looking to the past for inspiration. The future is unknown, but history, it's knowable and it's tangible. It's through, I think, looking and, and learning our history, and especially I feel this as a woman of color in this technology industry, that I'm allowed to kind of build from the strength of others who've paved the way before me. And then I'm able to pass on that wisdom and that that I gained myself along my journey to the next generation. 
and create a bridge to the future that's different than the past and in some ways better, more equitable, and more inclusive. My journey um, here as the founder of BGC, Black Girls Code, it started long ago. Our nonprofit was really created with a, a mission, if you will, to introduce girls from underrepresented communities to the field of technology back in 2011. And my inspiration for this organization was my daughter, Kai. Back in 2011, Kai was just a young, geeky 10-year-old at the time who spent most of her time, both then and now, playing Game Boys, Nintendos, and Xboxes, and any game she could get her hands on. What she really wanted most at that time was to be a video game tester. She wanted to have access to all the latest and greatest games long before her friends. As I encouraged her to think just a little bit bigger and learn how to create those games that she spent so much of her time playing, that's when the idea for Black Girls Code emerged. Since 2011, BGC has been guided by this quest to shape and mold the future of these bright, curious, and capable young girls like Kai who come into our classrooms, workshops, and enrichment events each and every year. Back in 2011, we set this, what we like to call, hairy, audacious goal to train one million girls to code by 2040. To date, we've reached over 30,000 students in 15 cities across the world. Now, we still have a lot of work to do. And sometimes it makes me a little anxious thinking about how far we have to go to hit that goal. But we've certainly made a dent. And I think we've made a lot of noise in an industry that really has traditionally been very male and often lacking in racial and ethnic diversity. I've come to think that a lot of what we've achieved here at BGC over the past 10 years goes much farther than just teaching girls how to code. I now see this work that we're doing at BGC as a playbook, if you will, which teaches our students how to secure their rightful place at the table. The journey that our students embark on can be seen, I like to say an analogy of an unfinished stepladder where each girl and each student can stand on the rungs laid down before them, but also spend a little bit of her time building the next rung for the girls who will follow. Now, it's a precarious and a dangerous visual to be sure, but I think there's some helpful truths to it. As we look back at the contributions of people of color and technology from our past, it allows us to embrace this concept of identity and belonging. So our girls know not only do they belong, but that we've been here all along and all the time before. And with that, I'd like to start by sharing some thoughts about a woman who has for more than 50 years set an example for all of us. Her name is Dr. Shirley Ann Jackson a brilliant black scientist and inventor and physicist, and the 18th president of Ranslayer Polytechnic Institute. Now, hopefully that name is familiar to some of you, but if not, let me share just a few brief highlights of some of Dr. Jackson's history-making and path-breaking career. In 1964, Dr. Jackson entered MIT as one of only five African-American students in a freshman class of 900. She went on to become the first African-American woman to earn a doctorate degree from MIT. Now, at the time, this made her only the second African-American woman to earn a doctorate in physics in the entire United States. In 1995, President Clinton named her to the chair of the Nuclear Regulatory Commission. And in 2014, President Obama awarded her the National Medal of Science 
making her the first African-American woman to achieve that honor. When I think about all of these accomplishments made by Dr. Jackson, a black woman coming into adulthood at the tail end of the Jim Crow era and at the start of the civil rights struggle, I am amazed. In 2009, she gave an interview with NPR and she reflected on those early days back at MIT. And she remembered in that interview how many of her fellow white students refused to study with her, even eat in the cafeteria with her, back at her days at MIT. And yet that is also the ground where she began to build the rungs of the ladder many of us stand on today. She's also spoken in her work about those were her most important role models. Myself, because I identify as a first of in so many ways, I think it's so important to learn from those folks who Dr. Jackson looked to for guidance and support along her journey. I think it's not a surprise that one of the first folks she names is her mother. Her mother was orphaned as a teenager and actually grew up in a part of Virginia where there were no public schools for African-American students. And yet, her older siblings pooled together all their money, put it all together in a pot, and were able to send Dr. Jackson's mother away to a boarding school. And even from those very humble and challenging beginnings, she completed college, she began a career as a social worker, and of course, she would eventually become the mother to this groundbreaking woman. And she taught her an important lesson. Accept no limitations on your potential. Dr. Jackson's other role models, these were the African-American women who were her teachers. These women, she said, would not brook less than her best effort. And at the same time, they nurtured her innate talents. High expectations combined with this nurturing environment are some of the lessons we can draw from these examples shared by Dr. Jackson. These high expectations coupled with supportive environments are what helped Dr. Jackson develop her self-confidence and her identity as a scientist, as an educator, and dare I say, as an activist. Now, activist can be a loaded word, and I'm not sure Dr. Jackson would describe herself that way, but I believe she is all three, and that we as technologists must also be all three. After her initial challenges at MIT, Dr. Jackson would join a group of organizers that would, over time, create the very first black student union at MIT. As she transitioned from her undergraduate years to her MIT graduate program, she was also named to the school's new task force on educational opportunity. And within this task force, she traveled all across the country, leading MIT's first efforts to recruit more students of color to the university. That next fall, 57 African-American students enrolled in MIT. Now that was 10 times the number of students, if you recall, in her freshman year. And yet, that's still such a small number. But like I said, one rung after the other after the other. This, for me, is the essence of activism. Well, Dr. Jackson's work to create equity in STEM fields for women of color began over 50 years ago. There were many others who were trailblazers before her who laid some of those first rungs on the ladder which Dr. Jackson would eventually climb. They're often what I like to call unsung heroes, hidden figures, if you will. Yet their contributions and achievements created the pathway for Dr. Jackson and the other men and women of color who would eventually follow her. In a recent NPR interview, Dr. Jackson noted that she came of age at a time in history when the Brown versus Board of Education Supreme Court decision initiated structural changes and the Soviet launch of Sputnik started what she called a space race that inspired so many in her generation to explore what we now call STEM. 
Now, when we think of Sputnik, NASA, the space race, I think that many of us are reminded of those once, quote unquote, hidden figures such as Katherine Johnson, Dorothy Vaughn, Mary Jackson, who were brilliantly brought to our attention just a few years ago with the cinema release of Hidden Figures. These technologists were some of the very first female mathematicians or computers as they were called then to be employed by NASA in the early 50s and they played key roles in our early endeavors in space exploration. However, these women whose stories were revealed so brilliantly on screen for each of us are but a few of the many heroines and computers of that era who forged a path and made a dent in history with their contributions to science. I'd like to introduce a few more. Melba Roy Moyton was an American mathematician born in 1929 in Fairfax, Virginia, in the middle of the Jim Crow era. Melba graduated from Howard University. Yes, that Howard University, which is the alma mater of our Vice President-elect Kamala Harris, in 1950 with a master's degree in mathematics. Melba began working for NASA in 1959 in the second wave of women computers to follow that trailblazing class of Catherine, Mary, and Dorothy. The year after she began her work at NASA, ECHO-1 was launched into orbit and Melba led a team of mathematicians in tracking its orbit. Like those before her and other contemporaries of her time, Melba was one of the earliest computers, or really computer scientists, and she taught classes on early coding languages such as APL. She spent a long and prodigious career with NASA, receiving an Apollo Achievement Award before she retired in 1973. Well, Katherine Johnson, Dorothy Vaughn, and Mary Jackson paved the way for those who followed them, such as Melba Moulton. Melba and her groundbreaking work painted pathways or put another rung on the ladder for those who would follow her in their pursuits of science and technology. Two men of color who are often forgotten and yet who have made outstanding contributions to the fields of math, science, and technology are James West and Dr. Mark Dean. James was born in 1931 in Virginia, and Mark was born in 1957 in my home state of Tennessee. They were early inventors and geeks, as we say, who turned their love for science into groundbreaking careers in tech. James grew up with a fascination for how things work and got into lots of trouble growing up for taking things apart around his house to see how they work, sometimes with mixed results. James turned this passion for learning into how things work into a career in telecommunications industry at Bell Labs after he graduated from Temple University with a degree in physics. It's been said that his parents were actually a little reluctant to let James get a degree in physics since at the time they were worried about how a black man would be able to create a successful life in a field in which so few were allowed to succeed at the time. But succeed he did. Dr. West went on to develop more than 250 patents during his career at Bell Labs and most importantly, he invented the foil electric microphone, which is a device that's used in more than 90% of all microphones today. So every time we pick up our phones to talk to a loved one, we dial into a Zoom meeting, or even give a speech like this, we owe a little bit to Dr. West for making it possible for our voices to be heard. Similar to James West, Dr. Mark Dean channeled his early love for science and technology into a career which has had an indelible impact on the tech world as we know it today. After receiving a PhD in electrical engineering from Stanford in the mid 60s, Dr. Dean went on to begin his career as an inventor and a computer engineer at IBM. Mark made foundational discoveries to IBM's early work in the personal computer marketplace and is generally credited with helping to launch the personal computing age. Dr. Dean holds three of the company's nine patents for the personal computer, and he invented the color computer monitor and the gigahertz chip. 
I think it's safe to say that computing as we know it today would not be quite the same if the rungs of the ladder had not been put in place for innovators such as Dr. West and Dr. Dean to climb. While the stories of these past heroines and heroes are incredibly inspiring, I could not let this opportunity pass without introducing you to one of my favorite hidden figures and pioneers of the video game industry, Jerry Lawson. Little did I know when I founded BGC back in 2011, then one of the pioneers of the modern video game era was passing the torch just a short distance away where my daughter Kai was discovering her passion for game development. As I mentioned before, one of my motivating factors for creating BGC was driven by this desire to support my daughter Kai. She's an avid gamer both then and now and spent all of her time playing Dungeons and Dragons, Game Boys, Nintendos, etc., to my very strong dismay as a parent. I wanted to build a community around Kai, filled with other girls who looked like her, shared some of her same passions, so that she could build her identity as a gamer and a technologist. Unbeknownst to me, or even my daughter Kai, one of the pioneers of the industry was literally right in our very own backyard. Gerald Anderson Lawson was born in 1940 in Brooklyn, New York, and he developed at a very young age a knack for tinkering with electronics and spent a lot of time as an electronic hobbyist and a ham radio enthusiast. Like many of the scientists I mentioned before, Jerry was inspired by other black role models and credited some of his early interest in science to the inventor George Washington Carver. Jerry attended a little bit of college and then, like many techies at the time, decided to drop out and join Fairchild Semiconductor in Silicon Valley in the 70s as an engineering consultant. These were some heady days in Silicon Valley and he was really engaged in developing this identity of the Valley as the hub of innovation. It was here at Fairchild that Jerry made his mark. He quickly rose up the ladder, rung by rung, and he was quickly also promoted to chief hardware engineer and later to the director of engineering in Fairchild's burgeoning video game division. Jerry and his team developed the concept for the very first video game cartridge and invented the Fairchild Channel F console, which would change video gaming forever. The Channel F and its interchangeable cartridges became the foundation of what would be popularized with this first wave of Atari systems and honestly, make my future life a living hell with the countless hours and dollars I've spent as a parent in places like GameStop buying these cartridges for my daughter's Game Boys, Xboxes, etc. decades later, but I digress. <laughs> Jerry was a pioneer and although somewhat forgotten, his contributions were pivotal to an industry which has continued to grow and expand and he's made a, a really lasting impact for future generations of techies and geeks like my daughter Kai. He literally revolutionized the video game industry from his Silicon Valley garage. Now, all of these stories of past pioneers such as Melba, Jerry, Mark, James, Shirley, and more are both important and their contributions were necessary. But I'd like to end by taking a look into both the present and future and shine a light on a young technologist who is shaping the future for all of us in real time. Her name is Joy Bogliolini. She's a Ghanaian American computer scientist and digital activist who's pursuing her PhD now at MIT, much like Dr. Jackson. Joy was born in 1989 and she developed her love for science and technology after seeing this robot called Kismet on TV and deciding at the tender age of nine that she was going to MIT to build cool stuff just like that. 
is the power of creating these big dreams for herself and cultivating her identity as a technologist and creator that would eventually lead her to pursue her CS degree at Georgia Tech years later, and indeed to land at the famed Media Lab at MIT, where she's currently pursuing her PhD and doing groundbreaking work in the field of AI and machine learning. Now Joy is the founder of a tech activist organization called the Algorithmic Justice League. She has focused her work on uncovering the biases endemic in algorithms and has been cited as a leading expert in the field, has testified before Congress, she's spoken in conference room of leading tech companies, and has become an advisor to researchers in the field of artificial intelligence and bias around the world. Joy's work is revolutionary. However, I think it's important to acknowledge how these heroes of our past make space for brilliant technologists and rogue scholars like Joy to make their own dent in the universe, to add another rung to the ladder, which leads to opportunities for thousands of girls and boys who will find and enjoy a space to claim their own identities as creators and technologists. These are just a few of the technologists and tech activists who inspire me daily to do what I do. And I hope that learning a bit of their stories has also inspired you. We as leaders and technologists are called to do more than make space at the table for our own dreams, goals, and ambitions. I believe we're called to shake up the system a little bit to make space at the table for others, especially for those who are different than us. We are surely the architects of the future, but how do we build something that's more equitable? How do we focus our efforts on eliminating the margins and leveling the playing field for those who are left out and often forgotten? I believe personally that it starts by telling their stories, ensuring that they are hidden no more. By reclaiming the space and the elevation of a broader identity for creators and innovators, that's how true change comes to life. But then, after we tell those stories, it's time to get to work. We must all embrace our identities, not just as techies, but as tech activists who push against the structural changes in a system that prevents more women and women of color, more people of color, more colleagues with disabilities, and other marginalized communities from entering the field of technology. This focus on creating space for marginalized communities in the field of technology is transformative, but not just for the potential market benefits of greater inclusion. People matter in and of themselves. Strategy is important in building an equitable world, but this reminder that we matter intrinsically, self-evidently, is how strong identities are forged, and it's our job to protect that. Our identities are forged when we bring these hidden figures and trailblazers to the forefront so that future generations realize, as Dr. Mark Dean once said, a lot of kids growing up today aren't told that you can be whatever you want to be. There may be obstacles, but there are no limits. This must be part of the moral core of the work we do as technologists, leaders, and yes, as tech activists. We must all be technologists, educators, and when we are called upon, we need to act. We must finally finish building this ladder so that our daughters, our granddaughters, our sons, and our grandsons can all stand on an equal playing field. This is how we build and finish building the ladder and reclaim our space, both in the past 
and in future generations. If you take nothing else from my words and things that I've shared with you today, I hope that you'll agree that our charge as tech leaders is about so much more than securing our own seat at the table, much more than about climbing these ladders alone. Because once we have arrived and we stand fully in our space, the time is right to do so much more. It's time to put our activist hats on. So it's then that it's time to help others find their way onward. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thanks also to all of our presenters and a special thanks to our keynote speaker, Kimberly Bryant. We're living in a very noisy virtual world right now with so many of us working from home. So we really appreciate you choosing to spend your time with us. Our booth's gonna remain open until 4 p.m. Pacific. So please stop by and say hi if you haven't already. You can also book meetings with our team via a link in the booth. Many thanks again. Enjoy the rest of your day.